The Bible class today is on Job chapter 31. So if you would, turn in your Bibles to Job chapter 31, and let's begin. We'll be going verse by verse through the chapter. In Job 31, Job finishes his discourse by listing a series of sins and denying them all. The chapter is divided into eight paragraphs, with each chapter being in denial of sin. And while we have no precise listing of, of all the sins, looking at each of the eight paragraphs, we see sins of lust, deceitfulness, adultery, oppression, unkindness, covetousness, idolatry, vindictiveness, miserliness, hypocrisy, and exploitation. Note the if clauses as we study today. If Job is wicked, then he believes that he should be punished for his wickedness. However, Job affirms his innocence. The chapter concludes with verse 40, the words of Job are ended. And we'll get to that shortly. But let's begin with verses 1 through 4, lust. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? Job begins by saying that he made a covenant with his eyes. It is as though he made a binding agreement with his eyes not to look upon a young woman. He argues, why then should he look intently or gaze upon a young woman with lust? In the New Testament, Jesus admonished the man who looks to lust. In Matthew 5, 28, But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And so here in our text, the words look upon, or as in the footnote, look intently or gaze. And so looking lustfully. Verse 2. For what is the allotment of God from above and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? There is no allotment from God or inheritance from the Almighty for the man who looks upon a young woman with lust. He would have no inheritance, no allotment from God. Verse 3, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for workers of iniquity? The only allotment of God for the wicked is destruction. And the inheritance of the Almighty for workers of iniquity is disaster. Job 31, 2. For him to look to lust would only result in his ruin. Therefore, he made a covenant, this binding agreement with his eyes, not to look upon a young woman. Job 31, 1. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Job says that God does see his ways. Man may not see everything that he does, but God sees everything. The Almighty does count all of his steps. If Job did break his covenant with his eyes, the Almighty who numbers his steps would see. Job was a man of purity. Verses 1 to 4. He was not guilty of, of lust. Number two, deceitfulness, verses five to eight. If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, Job speaks metaphorically of his manner of life as a walk or as his foot, walked or foot, verse five. First, he did not walk or live with falsehood. He did not practice lying or making untrue statements to others. 
Second, he did not hasten after deceit. That is, he did not deceive others. In the book of Proverbs, Solomon gave seven things that the Lord hates. In Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, two of the seven included a lying tongue, verse 17, and a witness, a false witness who speaks lies, in verse 19. Solomon also mentions feet that are swift in running to evil, in verse 18. And so here, Job says, if I walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, the point is this, that he did not walk with falsehood. He did not hasten to deceit. But if he did, then he ought to be judged. We have this if-then. If he did practice sin, then he ought to be punished. But his conviction was that he was innocent. Verse 6. Let me be weighed on honest scales that God may know my integrity. Job says that if he is guilty of living in falsehood and deceit, then he would be willing to be punished for his dishonesty. However, he only asks that he be weighed on just scales or honest scales. How might a scale be honest or how might a scale be just? We might say accurate scales. He asks that God weigh him so that God himself may know his integrity. Of course he knew. Job wants to be given a fair and honest trial based on the facts at hand. If he is found guilty, then he will accept the punishment for his sin. If he is found innocent, then he will accept the acquittal. The reader knows that God knew his integrity. Job chapter 2 and 3. Have you considered my servant Job? God said. Verse 7. If my step has turned from the way, or my heart walked after my eyes, or if any spot adheres to my hands. Job did not walk with falsehood or deceit. Verse 5. His heart did not follow his eyes. That is, he did not walk in lust. Verse 1. His hands were clean and undefiled, unspotted. He was innocent. However, if he was justly weighed and found guilty, he would accept the punishment. Verse 8. Then let me sow and another eat. Yes, let my harvest be rooted out. Job describes a curse upon the fruit of his labor. If found guilty, let him sow and another eat. Someone else would eat the crops that he planted. Or let everything he had planted, the produce of the field, be uprooted or rooted out. In verses 5 to 8, we see that Job was a man of integrity, not dishonesty, as the wicked. Number three, in verses 9 to 12, adultery. If my heart has been enticed by a woman, or if I have lurked at my neighbor's door, Job's heart has not been enticed by a woman. He has not yielded to a woman who would entice or tempt him to commit adultery. He is, he affirms, no adulterer. In Job 24 and verse 15, the eye of the adulterer waits for the twilight, saying, no eye will see me, and he disguises his face. And so, picture of the adulterer concealing his person so as not to be seen in his sin, sneaking around, lurking in the shadows. He has not lurked at his neighbor's door waiting for his neighbor's wife. He did not covet his neighbor's wife. Solomon warned against the seductress in 
Proverbs chapter 7. Chapter 31, verse 10. Then my let my wife grind for another and let others bow down over her. Job says that if he so sinned against his neighbor with his neighbor's wife in adultery, then let his neighbor do the same with his wife. Of course, these are self-imposed curses upon himself. He's, he's saying in the strongest language that he can that he is innocent. If this is true, if I'm guilty of this, then let this happen to me. He certainly did not want these things to happen to him, but he did not believe that he was guilty. He says here in verse 10, first, let my wife grind for another. In a literal sense, this may refer to grinding at a meal, meal grinding. Let her serve another man as a maidservant. Let her turn the millstone for him. For example, women would take the millstone and grind meal, like in Isaiah 47 and 2. Now, the second part of the passage says, let others bow down over her. Bow down over her is a Hebrew idiom for sexual relations. He's saying, he's affirming that he's innocent. However, in the strongest language possible, if not, then let this curse come upon me. Let his wife be given to another man. Note the words, my wife. Job was the husband of one wife. This was the institution of marriage as it was from the very beginning, as we see in the book of Genesis, as Jesus pointed out in the New Testament. Job is no polygamist. Note the singular use of my wife or his wife. Like in Job 2.9 and Job 19.17, he had one wife. To have his wife given to another man would be to him a, a great curse, as it would to any, any sensible man. Consider the blessings and curses given to Israel. Those who were disobedient to God would receive the curse. Deuteronomy 28, read the chapter sometime. And you see a long list of things, of blessings for the obedient and curses for the disobedient. One of the curses in Deuteronomy 28, 30 is similar to what we see in this passage. You shall betroth a wife, but another man shall lie with her. You shall build a house, but you shall not dwell in it. You shall plant a vineyard, but shall not gather its grapes. Verse 11. For that would be wickedness. Yes, it would be iniquity deserving of judgment. It certainly would. The act of adultery, sexual relations with his neighbor's wife would be wickedness. It would be iniquity deserving of judgment. This wickedness and iniquity should be judged. This same term occurs later in the chapter in verse 28. This also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment. So he lists another, which he describes in the same fashion. Job describes adultery as wickedness. It is, a, as in some versions, a, a lustful crime. That is true. It is also a heinous crime. Terrible, terrible offense. And should be judged. And if not by the law of the land, it ultimately would be judged by God. Verse 12. For that would be a fire that consumes to destruction and would root out all my increase. Earlier, Job said in chapter 31, 3, is it not destruction for the wicked and disaster for workers of iniquity? 
Now, Job says that adultery would be a, a fire that consumes to destruction. It is like a fire that burns. One might think of lust that burns. It would root out or uproot all of his increase. Think about the harm, damage done, ruin brought by iniquity, wickedness, such as adultery. Earlier, Job said, yes, let my harvest be rooted out, if, if such is the case, verse 8. Let's look again at Proverbs chapter 6, this time in verses 25 to 29. He admonishes, do not lust after her beauty in your heart, nor let her allure you with her eyelids. For by means of a harlot, a man is reduced to a crust of bread, and an adulteress will prey upon his precious life. Can a man take fire to his bosom and his clothes not be burned? Can one walk on hot cools and his feet not be steered, seared? So is he who goes in to his neighbor's wife. Whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Job was a man of purity. He had a wife and he was faithful to her. He had not committed adultery. To do so had been like taking fire to his chest and being burned. He, the, the writer in Proverbs 6 says that he who goes into his neighbor's wife, whoever touches her shall not be innocent. Joe believed that he was innocent. And he stood by it. Number four oppression and verses 13 to 15 if i have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complained against me the point is job never despised the cause of his servants when they complained against him to say that they complained against him doesn't necessarily mean that he had done wrong against them only that they had some complaint Perhaps he had done something wrong. He wanted them to, and did not hinder them from bringing their complaint to him. And so he never rejected the cause or despised the claim of his servants, of any of his servants. If one did come before him with a complaint, he gave the complaint of his servant all due regard. He was fair to his male and female servants. Verse 14. What then shall I do when God rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? Job permitted his servants to come before him with their complaints, even as he desires to come before God to defend himself. Job asks, what can he do when God rises up? confronts him in judgment? Or what can he do when God punishes or visits him to judge? Job wanted to be permitted to answer God. He wanted to make his case before him and for God to hear him. Verse 15. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Job and his servants were all made and fashioned by the same God in the womb. Therefore, Job could not despise the cause of his male or female servant. Verse 13. Why? He who made me made them too. Job knew that God made him and also that God made his male and female servants as well. Knowing that they shared the same God as their maker, Job treated his servants with justice. He treated them fairly. Think if more people today had the same understanding of, of God as creator and we as his creation, that we are all in a sense brothers and sisters with the same father. 
that what we do to someone else, we're doing to a brother or we're doing to a sister. A son or a daughter of God who made us. Consider the words of Malachi. In a sense, we are all we all have one father. We all have one God who created us. Regrettably, those who were in Malachi's time were without the understanding, this understanding, and dwelt, dealt treacherously with each other. Maybe they knew it, but they sure didn't act like it. Malachi 2.10, have we not all one father? Has not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? People in Malachi's day dealing treacherously with each other. Have we not just, have we not one father? Yes. God who has created us. We have the same creator. And so that ought to influence how we treat other people. And it did with Job and others, such as his servants. He treated them well. The Apostle Paul in the New Testament taught that masters and bondservants belong to the same master. This was something for the masters to think about. Ephesians 6 and 9, and you masters do the same things to them, giving up threatening, knowing that your own master also is in heaven, and there is no partiality with him. We all have the same creator, the same father. We belong to him. Number five unkindness. And so Job was fair. He was not guilty of oppression. In verses 16 to 23, we see the sin of unkindness. Job was a man of kindness and consideration for others. Verse 16, he said, if I have kept the poor from their desire or caused the eyes of the widow to fail, he had not. Job was not unkind. First, he says that he has not kept the poor from their desire. In fact, he gave the poor what they desired. Second, he has not caused the eyes of the widow to fail. So he has not left the widow to weep in despair. He has not dashed the hopes of the widow. Earlier, Job said in chapter 29 and 12, I delivered the poor who cried out. And in chapter 29 and 13, I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. And so he was not guilty of this unkindness of keeping the poor from their desire or causing the eyes of the widow to fail. He gave to those who were in need and he gave hope to the hopeless. Help the helpless. Widow's heart sang for joy. Chapter 29, 13. Verse 17. Or eaten my morsel by myself so that the fatherless could not eat of it. The problem is not that Job ate food. The problem would be, if it were true, that Job ate food and did not share with anyone else who was in need. Job shared his food with the orphans, the fatherless. He was not selfish or unconcerned. He did not keep his bread to himself, thinking solely or only of himself. Job said that he delivered the fatherless and the one who had no helper, Job 29 and 12. Verse 18. But from my youth, I reared him as a father, and from my mother's womb, I guided the widow. Job expands upon his treatment of the fatherless and the widow in verses 16 to 17. Here in verse 18, he points out that from early in his life, Job reared the orphan as a father would 
rear his child and he guided the widow. He helped the widow. Let's look at the words from my mother's womb. This is hyperbolic. He's using a hyperbole, this uh, exaggeration for the purpose of emphasis. Job did not literally guide the widow from the time that he was born or the time that he was still in the womb or coming from his mother's womb. He simply means that it has been a practice of his all of his life, a lifelong practice of caring for the widows. He cared for the widow all of his life. He cared for the fatherless and the widow from his youth. The second part of the passage helps to explain. Or the first part of the passage helps to explain the second. From my youth, from my mother's womb. And so from early on, he, he cared for the orphans and he cared for the widows. Verse 19. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing or any poor man without covering, besides food, Job also provided clothing. First, Job says that no one ever perished before his sight because of the lack of clothing. He provided for anyone who lacked clothing. Second, the poor did not perish without covering. If he saw the needy without, with nothing to wear, he provided the needy with clothing. Job was a very wealthy man, and he had the resources to be able to provide for all those that he saw who were in need. Verse 20. If his heart has not blessed me, and if he had, if he was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep, Job provided a woolly covering for the poor man who blessed him. And this may mean that the grateful poor man praised or thanked Job. So Job provided him with a covering, and the man blessed him praised him or gave him thanks. The needy was warmed or kept warm with the fleece, the wool that came from Job's sheep. The wool of his sheep gave them a, a warm covering in the cold so that they did not perish. Verse 21, if I have raised my hand against the fatherless when I saw that I had helped help in the gate, Job did not act against the fatherless. He was just and fair in judgment. He was fair in business. The context is the gate which was the place where court decisions were made and where business was conducted. Job had a seat in the gate, as we saw earlier in the book. Job says that he had not raised his hand, perhaps with a threatening gesture against the orphan, the fatherless, taking advantage of his position, his power, or those who might support him in the gate. And to raise the hand, again, might suggest some injustice, perhaps showing favoritism or, or partiality, acting in a way as to take advantage of others or his position, his power. He did not act that way. He was fair and just. To raise the hand might also suggest physical violence. Well, he certainly did not physically abuse the fatherless or the orphans. But in the context of the gate, we might say the court, place where these decisions and judgments were made, he did not raise his hand 
against the fatherless. He certainly did not. And in fact, he helped them. Verse 22. He, but if this is true, if, if he is guilty of this, he says, let this happen to me. Let this curse come upon me. And what a curse. Look at verse 22. He said, then let my arm fall from my shoulder. Let my arm be torn from the socket. The curses that he, he uses in order to affirm that he is innocent and that he is not guilty of these things are, are great. Job had not shown showed unkindness to the helpless. Verses 16 to 21. In the strongest manner possible, calling for curses to come upon himself if he was guilty, he affirmed his innocence. If he had raised his hand against the fatherless, the orphan, if he had exerted his power against them, he said, then let his arm fall from his shoulder and his arm be torn from the socket. He did not act against orphans, nor the widow or the poor. In fact, he helped them. Verse 23. For destruction from God is a terror to me, and the cause of his magnificence I cannot, cannot endure. What restrained Job from acting against the helpless? For some people, it's the law. They're afraid that if they get caught, then they will face judgment. They would be punished. However, Job was not restrained by his fear of judges. Job, with his power in the gate, was not restrained by man's judgment. Job was restrained by his fear of God. Job was a God-fearing man. He really didn't need laws telling him that it was unlawful to act against the poor or the orphan or the fatherless, the widow. Job feared God. First, Job was terrified of God's judgment. Second, Job could not do such evil things because of the magnificence the exaltation of God in his glory. He held God in great awe and respect. To be God-fearing means not only to, to be afraid of God and his judgment, but to hold God in awe and respect, as Job did. Think of more people feared God today. great motivation for not committing such crimes and the sins that we're listing here. Number six, covetousness in an idolatry, verses 24 to 28. If I have made gold my hope or said to find gold, you are my confidence. Job did not place his hope or confidence in gold, even fine gold. While the wealthy, while he was wealthy and very rich, he was not a covetous man. His affection did not reside with gold. His heart was with the Almighty. Job 22, 24 to 25. In the New Testament, remember what Jesus said. You cannot serve God and mammon, Luke 16, 13. And also the apostle of Christ, Paul, said and wrote in Colossians 3, 5, covetousness, which is idolatry. Job was not a covetous man, nor was he an idolater. Some people make gold their God. U.S. motto, motto in God we trust. Unfortunately, many people in, in riches they trust, in money they trust. Verse 25. If I have rejoiced because my wealth was great and because my hand had gained much, 
Job's point is, is that he did not rejoice because he had great wealth. He was a wealthy man, very rich man, but he didn't boast because of his riches. He did not rejoice or boast that by his own hand, he had gained so much wealth. I did it all myself. Glory to me. Job did not have that kind of attitude. In fact, at the beginning of the book, Job 21, 20, Job 1 and 21, when Job heard what had happened to his, to his family and possessions, he was sorrowful, but he continued to trust God. The Lord gave, he said, in Job 1 and 21. And the Lord takes away. He thought that God took away these things from him. He thought that God had brought the calamity upon him and his family. Job was ignorant of, of who actually caused the calamity, who, who actually brought it upon him. But he was correct in saying the Lord gave. Job did not boast as if by his own hand he had gained all this wealth. Verse 26, if I have observed the sun when it shines or the moon moving in brightness, the problem was not observing the sun or observing the moon moving across the sky from his perspective, looking up and seeing the sun or seeing the moon. The sun of the day, the moon and none. The sin was idolatry. It's not specifically mentioned in this passage, but that's what he's talking about. Job did not worship the sun nor the moon. Job feared the Almighty who made the sun, the moon, and the stars. Other people may have committed idolatry and worshipped these celestial bodies. These things of the creation of God but Job feared the Lord. Genesis 1.16, the Genesis account concerning creation. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made the stars also. And so he describes the sun and the moon and the stars. The creator created these heavenly bodies. They were not created to be worshipped. Only the creator is worthy of worship. Verse 27. So then my heart has been secretly enticed, and my mouth has kissed my hand. Job's heart was not enticed to practice idolatry any more than he was enticed to practice adultery. The act of kissing the hand was that of throwing or blowing kisses to the idol, such as the sun or the moon. In other passages, we see the literal kissing of these idols, these graven images. Hosea 13 and 2, the prophet wrote, Now they sin more and more and have made for themselves molded, images, idols of their silver, according to their skill. All of it is the work of craftsmen. They say of them, let the men who sacrifice kiss the calves. One might think of the golden calf that the people worshipped after the exodus. Here, the kissing of the calf, the, the idol. Well, they could not actually kiss the sun or the, the moon from the earth. The picture of them blowing kisses. So this foolish act of an idolatry. Verse 28. This also would be an iniquity deserving of judgment, for I would have denied God who is above. Earlier, Job spoke of adultery as iniquity, deserving of judgment in verse 11. 
The practice of idolatry also is deserving of judgment. To worship the creation, the sun and the moon, would be to deny God the creator above himself. Such would be foolish and immoral. And Job was not guilty of idolatry. Verses 29 to 37, we see sins like vindictiveness and miserliness and hypocrisy. Verse 29, if I have rejoiced at the destruction of him who hated me or lifted myself up when evil found him. Eliphaz claimed that the righteous rejoice when the wicked are cut down back in Job 22, 19 to 20. However, Job here denies any vindictiveness. First, he had not rejoiced at the destruction of his enemy, one who hated him. Second, he had not lifted himself up as if to gloat when evil or trouble came to his enemy or those who hated him. He certainly didn't do this with his friends. He didn't even do it with his enemies. But one thinks of the terrible accusations brought by his friends against him. Verse 30. Indeed, I have not allowed my mouth to sin by asking for a curse on his soul. And so, moreover, Job explains that he had not even asked for a curse against him who he who hates him. For Job to curse the soul of his enemy, to ask for his life, would have been a sin. Job was approaching the morality found in the teaching of Jesus. In the New Testament, Matthew 5 and 44, Jesus taught, love your enemies. Some were saying, hate your enemies. Jesus said, love your enemies. Job makes the point that he, he had not cursed those who hated him. Verse 31. If the men of my tent have not said, who is there that has not been satisfied with his meat? He changes to the sin of, of inhospitality. Job is hospitable. He cares for strangers. He did not let strangers go away hungry. The members of Job's own household, including his male and female servants, would be unable to remember anyone who had not been satisfied with the meat from Job's flocks or herds. He had, and as he had, he was willing to give to those who were in need. Verse 32, But no sojourner had to lodge in the street, for I have opened my doors to the traveler. Job explains that he left no sojourner to lodge in the street. The term refers to a temporary resident. Here the stranger requires hospitality and lodging. He opens his door to the traveler or the wayfarer, the person of the road or the way. This term sojourner in other contexts is sometimes rendered as alien or stranger or foreigner. And so Job showed hospitality to strangers, these love of strangers. Verse 33, if I have covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, Job was sincere. He was no hypocrite. The first man, Adam, had sinned and hid himself. Genesis 3.10. The name Adam means man. Uh, some take the passage to mean if I have covered my transgressions as man, men do. However, there's no reason to not see uh, an illusion or a, a point made of Adam here, the first man Adam, in the Genesis account. Job says that he did not cover his transgressions as Adam or hide his iniquity in his bosom. Job never claimed to be sinless. For instance, Job spoke of the iniquities of my youth in Job 13, 26. 
However, he continually denied charges of his friends against him and claimed innocence. Verse 34. Because I feared the great multitude and dreaded the con contempt of families, so that I kept silent and did not go out of the door. It was not as though Job covered his transgressions because he feared the great multitude or hid his iniquity because he dreaded the contempt of families. These things did not cause him to keep silence or stay behind closed doors. He was not moved by a fear of, of shame of the community. Job was blameless. He was above reproach. And while he was not sinless, he believed that he was innocent of the charges made by his friends against him. He did not conceal any transgressions or any iniquities from others of which he might have been ashamed. If he was guilty of some practice of iniquity and transgression in his life, he certainly was not concealing it or hiding it as, as Adam who hid himself after sinning against God. Job was not hiding any sins. He was not motivated by the fear of men. He was motivated by the fear of God. Oftentimes, people will say, well, I don't care what people think. Well, do you care what God thinks? Job did. Verse 35, oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my mark. Oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had a written, had written a book. Job wanted someone to hear him and to listen to his case. He had told his friends of his innocence, but they were closed-minded, would not listen. They thought that he suffered because of the practice of sin, transgression, and iniquity in his life. Job says, here is my mark. Other versions read, here's my signature. You make your mark. You make your X. So here he says, here is my mark. Here is my signature. It is as though Job signed his own defense. He's confident of his innocence, and he is waiting for the prosecutor, his prosecutor, literally his accuser, to answer him. And in this context, the prosecutor is the Almighty. He says, Job says, oh, that my prosecutor had written a book. What is the book? He longs for the book. And some other versions read, indictment. He's confident that he will be acquitted, set free from the charges of offense. But he longs for the book, and perhaps here he's describing this book of indictment against him. He wants to know the charges against him. Verse 36, surely I would carry it on my shoulder and bind it on me like a crown, Job says that he would carry this that book on his shoulder and bind the book on him like a crown. Verse 35. He did not hide his sin as if he was afraid of the reproach of the people. 33 to 34. In fact, he would wear the book, perhaps this book of indictment, these charges against him, for everyone to see, openly facing the accusations. And if convicted, he would wear the charges. Openly, he would not hide it. Verse 37. I would declare to him the number of my steps. Like a prince, I would approach him. Job would give the Almighty, his prosecutor, a full account of all of his steps. He wouldn't hide anything. Not that he would need to. He would approach him like a prince with dignity. He was confident in, confident in his innocence. Number eight, we see the sin of exploitation. Verses 38 to 40. Verse 38, if my land cries out against me and its furrows weep together. The 
land of Job is personified as a witness, witness to the potential sin. First, Job says that the land, his land, does not cry out against him. Second, the furrows of the land do not weep together against him. And so if his land could talk, his land would, would have new charges against him. Verse 39. If I have eaten its fruit without money or caused its owners to lose their lives. First, Job says that he has not eaten the fruit of the land without money or payment. This may refer to Job paying the laborers who labored in his fields. He paid them wages for their work. Second, he has not obtained the land by causing the lawful owners of the land to lose their lives. For example, Naboth was murdered for his vineyard in 1 Kings 21. Verse 40. And so if it is, if I'm guilty of exploitation, he says, then let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Job says that if he committed exploitation, as revealed by the land, let thistles grow instead of wheat and weeds instead of barley. Instead of bar grain of grains of wheat and barley, he would have thistles and weeds. Such a curse would make the land useless to Job. But he was willing to be punished, to accept such curses if he was guilty. However, Job believed that he was innocent. The last part of the passage, the last part of the chapter, the words of Job are ended. This is not the end of the book. However, this is the end of the discourse. The discourse of Job with his three friends concludes. The words of Job are ended. They are finished. The three friends of Job are silenced. And the next time we study, we'll read of Elihu's presentation in Job 32 to 37. We hope that this chapter has been helpful for you today in better understanding. That this lesson has been helpful in better understanding this chapter. It's a, it's a rather long chapter. There's a lot in this chapter, uh, a lot of good to consider, and the great, and the great uh, morality of Job, this righteous man of integrity. We invite you to come back next time, and until then, we encourage you to continue your study of God's Word. Thank you for being here.